All right. Once again, we're back at it. Both of us on the mend. <laughs> Snuffles is here listening pretty good. And yeah. So. Am I still snuffles? Because uh, now I'm not snuffling as much because I got the surgery. Uh huh. Then how come when I put these headphones on, all I heard was. <laughs> Maybe the microphones are too sensitive. You ever think about that? Well, they everything's, are. Too, everything's too sensitive now. College <laughs> students, microphones, everything. Well, you know, we do have that issue in America a little bit. Mm. I mean,. I know that's one thing I find funny because, well, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, a lot of my friends here in Jersey are either jujitsu people or like Eastern European people. Mm -hmm. Similar mentalities. Uh, scarily, <laughs> yes. Very much a, oh, it hurt. Oh, yeah. Keep it up and go back. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that was actually funny watching my one friend rant about some stuff lately. Uh, just about culture stuff and people being, I don't want to say weak, but not meeting what she considers minimum standard of masculinity. Minimum masculinity. That's going to be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> minimum masculinity. <laughs> minimum masculinity. The Brother Will story. Just enough masculinity to pass as a man. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think mine should be called by the grace of God and ignorance of the abbot. <laughs> no, your friend you're talking about, she's kind of looking for your traditional provider protector type. Correct. Right. Yeah. Traditional provider protector. You know, she says loving and caring and compassionate, but also not afraid to be like, what on earth are you? No. Like give it to him straight. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Straightforward partnership and equals, but also not afraid to take charge yeah you know as she said when i come at you with a broom or a frying pan you better know how to deal with it <laughs> well i think about that a lot like the the idea of sensitivity a lot maybe it's because i don't know i think as as a religious person you you think about that a lot you know because you know i think especially living in a monastery or being a priest like you're you're I, I would say you're extra conscious of maybe how you come off to people. You don't want to come off as, you know, mean or nasty or, you know, um, sort of sharp with people or short with people, you know. Right. I, I mean, you I'm, definitely got to find that balance, right? Like you got to figure out when, where, how. Yeah. I think about that, you know, as someone who lives at a monastery, as a monk, um, I think about that as a teacher. You know, I'm just... Uh, for the school, we, our term just ended on Friday, and so we have to get grades in uh, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when you're when you're grading an essay, you know, there's so many different ways to say the same thing. Oh yeah, you know, and all those all those different ways sort of come off a different way to to the person that's reading it. Um, so I'm always uh, I'm always thinking about that, you know. Of course, you want to be sensitive to the person and not hurt their feelings or be a mean person on purpose. But on the other hand, you want to sort of take a stand at some point against or, you know, have a firm opinion about something, you know. Right. You can't be too afraid to say your view that you don't say anything. Right. And let's not lie. That's, we see that a lot in public discourse, not only people too afraid to stick to something, you know. Like her or not, you know, I mean, we watched together, you know, Matt Walsh's What is a Woman? Mm -hmm. And that was the classic thing there, you know, or the debate he had on Dr. Phil, where he just goes, okay, well, you said trans women are women. Awesome. What is a woman? Like, give me the, def define your terms. And even that question, some people would take as offensive, me offensive or even mean spirited. Right. Which it's not, you know, knowing, I mean, I've, I've listened to Matt Walsh a lot and he's, you know, he can be. Oh, he can troll. A very forward person, but I don't think he's a mean person. No. You know, he's someone who, and he says, he says this before, he's like someone who is, he wants to know the truth. Like, mm -hmm. what is the truth of the situation, you know? Um, yeah, so, you know, as a teacher, I think about that a lot. Um, or, you know, as a, as a, as a, a son or a sibling, you think about that stuff a lot. Because mm -hmm. um, I think now one of the issues with, sensitivity is 
Is it good to be sensitive to other people? Yes. When you start to use your sensitivity as like a cudgel against other people, mm -hmm. like your sensitivity as a defense mechanism, I think that's when it becomes unhealthy or unproductive. True. You know, like you can't say this thing because I feel a certain way about it, right? Once you start sort of making rules around that, that, that to me starts to get a little silly. Oh, did you see that one high school teacher that used the N-word? Mm. And he didn't use it in an offensive way. What he did was two of his students who were African-American, or I think they were African-American, they were people of color, whether they were African-American or African or, you know, that I don't know from the story. But they were using it on each other, like repeatedly, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he comes over and goes, you can't say the word. And the kid goes, what did you say? You can't say this word. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, saying the word and does it like three times. And everybody walked out and they tried to get him suspended and ex not expelled, but fired for saying to the kids, school policy is you can't say this word. But because he was not a person of color and he used that word. Mm hmm. The students protested and tried to kick him out, even though the other students were just shooting it left and right at each other. And that's a big issue I see in the, uh, you know, nationally, like in the education system now, like mm -hmm. there's this immediate rush to dismiss the person, dismiss the offender mm -hmm. without, you know, hearing the offender's side of the thing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, and you're in a school and, and, and every kid has an English class and in an English class, if you have a decent English teacher, they should teach you, you know, about uh, intent. What is the intent of what you're saying? Exactly. You know, so obviously if, you know, these, these two kids are saying it back and forth, um, like in a friendly way they were saying it. Right. Yeah. Versus, you know, saying it in a derogatory way. Right. Obviously your intent there is different, right? So there should be some kind of punishment for that. But with mm -hmm. the teacher, he was just saying, don't say that. Right. This I, is school policy. You may not say this word. Right. Obviously, his intent wasn't to be derogatory toward the kids. Right. But now it's, again, it's so sensitive that it doesn't matter. It's like, we don't want to hear the story. You said it. That's it. And then no right. chance for redemption, no chance for forgiveness. Uh, you know, when conservatives talk all the time about cancel culture, mm -hmm. that's what that is. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't get a second chance. You don't get to explain your side of the story. You're gone, right? And that's something that's totally antithetical to Catholicism, Christianity, you know. Um, Absolutely. Like I was telling somebody recently, I was like, look, you know, because they, they were asking about all the issues in the church and all this stuff. And I was like, look, yeah, we're the body of Christ, but you got to remember, we're also led and made up of humans in this life. And in all of human history, there's only been two people. That have not messed up and sinned. Me One's and my dad. <laughs> <laughs> One's God incarnate, and the other was his mom. It's like, so let's not lie. Like, both basically cheated there. You got one who made the rules and holds the universe into existence simply by always being correct. And his mother. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean. Mom's always right. Yeah, you, yeah. you tell mom no. Yeah. <laughs> Which is actually why Mary is sort of our best intercessor with her son, because he ain't telling mom no. <laughs> well, you know, this is something that just came up. There was the uh, Ben Shapiro Sunday special this week was uh, Father Frank Pavone. Oh, nice. Who was... How'd that go over? Dismissed from yeah from the priesthood uh, after, I, I believe he said, the uh, the final sort of accusation from the Vatican was that he... Uh, said something blasphemous, blasphemous comments. That was part of it. He said this was kind of a the yeah, culmination he, of kind of a twenty year back and forth kind of fight with the higher ups. Yeah, from what I understand, he used the uh, the GD word a couple times in some tweets. Oh, now there's probably more to it. I don't know. We'll never know. Like you know, how you never know the real, real road. Right. There's the story, and then there's the story. Yeah. Right. You know as much as I do that the church still works as a medieval institution. And there are people that have papers, I'm sure even on us, that we're never going to see, we're never going to find out about. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's the famous story of uh, John the 23rd, 
when he was elected pope and he gets elected and all the different cardinals are coming up to do obeisance and you know kiss his hand and thank him and you know wish him luck and prayers all this stuff and the head of the cdf uh, then the congregation for the doctrine of faith the inquisition now we call it the dicastery for the doctrine of faith comes up and he goes and the pope the newly elected pope looks at him and goes well now that we are pope you can give us our file and the next day the cardinal showed up with the file and the pope's like what mm -hmm. i had a file mm -hmm. well it, it it's very short it's only yeah. a couple accusations yeah and so he literally opened it up and he was being accused of being a modernist and according to at least the legend is he took out his pen and wrote i am not nor have i ever been a modernist pp you want them x x i i i and then handed it back <laughs> i am not a modernist he wrote with a hammer and chisel yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a rock and chisel whatever it is but so so how did that uh frank provone thing go like uh, it was an awesome conversation but it reminded me you know that we started out with the sensitivity thing mm -hmm. of, you know you don't want to say anything that offends people and that was sort of the uh, sort of an underlying charge against him mm. that he had conversations with his uh, with his bishop that you know you don't want to you don't want to offend people you don't want to divide people mm -hmm. and he was like well if you take a look at Jesus mm -hmm. <laughs> he, you know he 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 offended people or you know he 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 said he said things in a way that made people want to crucify him. Right. I mean, that's... <laughs> also, he did say, like, I have come... You think I come to bring peace? I've come to bring division. Father against son, brother against brother. Mm hmm I mean, at the heart of it, because at the heart, Christianity is that radical call. That radical, like, no, God said this. God is right. I don't care. Let's do it. And I really think it's illustrative of, to me, from what I can tell, there are really two sort of main camps... Like, in terms of how the church should approach people, is it sort of, you know, there's one media outlet, I won't, I won't say who it is, calls it like the church of nice, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, I know that you're doing, you know, you may be doing these bad things, but God loves you. Mm -hmm. And there's not really any, um, like, call to, uh, like, greater discipline or to change the person, etc., Right. And then on the other side, it's like, no, you are, these bad things you're doing, you shouldn't do them. Right. And it's going to lead you down a bad path if you keep doing them. Yeah. Right. Well, that's like uh, one of the books, you know, I have on my shelf, I've read, and a friend of mine gave it to me. Um, it's by a uh, guy, Kennedy Hall. It's uh, Terror of Demons, Reca Reclaiming Traditional Catholic Masculinity. And it's about being a cultural warrior, new evangelization. But without pulling punches. Like like if you've ever read like Bishop Olmstead's Into the Breach, this takes that to the next level by like ten. Like like Kennedy is just like, all right, well, if you can't have your phone and not look at naughty stuff at night, then guess what? Don't have a phone for six months. Mm -hmm. Shocker. You can live without a phone. Right. Is it gonna be inconvenient? Yep. Are you gonna suffer? Yep. Is it going to be annoying? Right? Are you going to be frustrated? Is it better than burning in hell? Right. Yep. Yeah. You know, sort of that classic, if your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. If your mm -hmm. eye causes you to sin, plug it out. Not saying go do that. Origin tried that thing. It did not work out well. But again, this, you know, this he, hard... He, he cut off something? The, uh... Origin had issues with chastity. Oh, We'll call it the central appendage. <laughs> he did away with the central appendage. He went soprano. <laughs> and we're not talking Italian. And he did it himself? I guess. Oh. I don't know the Well, whole you can't really walk into a doctor and say, Doc, I need you to. <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> you back could. Then you could, yeah. I mean, ancient Greek actually has, I think, three or four different words for eunuchs based on what and how they were made eunuchs right some of them were born that way right well that's that's scripture some are born that way some are made that way by others some are choose that because of christ you know like the spiritual eunuchs like us without the girlfriends without the lady folk um 
But back in the day, they would make people eunuchs. They would, because, you know, if you want to be able to trust them around your wives, your daughters, or whatever, and not have to worry about them making their own little kids. Or if you had an enemy you captured, say your brother, say you and your brother were both princes, and, like, you didn't want to kill your brother, but you also didn't want have to worry about him getting an army and trying to become king himself. You might make him a eunuch, because if he can't have kids, it's not real much purpose in him being king. Right. Especially if you always go father son. Um, but yeah, they had they had multiple ways. In fact, I dated a girl who, years and years ago, who did a graduate paper on that. And I remember when she was doing the research, I just I just I just picked up one of the articles, um, and uh, she was actually at my friend Dan's apartment that day, and uh, I went to visit them both. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, ah, right, note to self. All right. Um, all right, uh, okay, it's frightening because, mm. like, it was a detailed description of the different types and methodologies and why they use this Greek word or this Greek word or that Greek word. Now, with the origin thing, wouldn't that be like self mutilation? Yeah, he but, was, but self mutilation for a spiritual purpose, I guess, would have a different. Well, he was condemned for it. Mm -hmm. That's why I said, like, don't do the origin, yeah, because he was condemned for it basically, even back then. The church was like, yeah, you took that a little too literally. I'm like, don't literally maim your body. Yeah. But that comes up even now. Like, if you look at the papal encyclicals on organ donation, you know, we basically loophole around that own bodily harm thing. So, like, you know, we, we say you got to respect the body. There are papal encyclicals that say you can't just donate an organ. Like, there's early ones. I think, I can't remember. It's one of the Piuses or one of the Pauls. And then John Paul II re-looked at it, and his justification was, in this way, yes, you can't. But what we got to rely on is if it's a free gift of love, then we can sidestep this objective wrongness. Because the intention and the greater good and, you know, insert X, Y, Z is better. So what was the argument against organ, organ donation that it was... You were disrespecting the body in some way? Yeah, that it's disrespectful to the body, that it's mm. um, all that. That it's, you know, it's inappropriate, it's not correct, it's not, you know, because we believe in the resurrection of the body. That's why for the longest time, cremation was uh, very frowned upon. You know, even when the Romans, the Romans for the most part cremated their dead. We insist on a catacombs and burying our dead. Because we believe, you know, like Christ, he rose from the dead, we need a body. Um, and to this day, you know, there are rules. Say you're cremated, you have to be buried. The whole, like, scatter the ashes is a no-no. Mm -hmm. The whole, I want a necklace with mom's ashes so I can right. always have her with me. Major no-no. Right. Um, because, again, that whole resurrection of the body, respect for the dead, respect for the body, even after it's dead um so like don't don't meaning like don't cut it up don't do anything extra to it right you know obviously you have to touch it in order to put right. it in a casket or whatever right. and, you know, shouldn't there. do anything disrespectful yeah which i always find ironic because you know when when somebody's like very clearly a saint what's one of the first things we do right we take relics right and it's like ah uh, yeah i see what you mm. did there which I find just not comical. It's not comical, but just like ironic. I don't yeah. know. Would that be irony? I don't know. No. It is ironic because they're they're saying they're saying a certain thing about not not using the body for certain purposes, and then they're going and going to them. do it. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Which brings me to my next point: is that we should bury people vertically to save space. You know. You know how deep you'd have to dig that <laughs> hole? Just because, like, think about it. Like, you got to get, like, the water line we just caused major issues. Because you got to dig deep enough that the water ain't going to push the body literally up out of the ground. Mm. And then you'd have, like, the body would just kind of crumple over in the casket. Unless it was a really tight casket, I guess. But yeah, I, mean, I mean, what's he going to do, complain? That's true. That's Though, true. I did see a hilarious review the other day. Somebody, like, it was like a funeral store that was selling caskets 
and somebody gave a five star review on a casket and just with the comments, no complaints from grandpa. <laughs> I was like, that is dark, but that is funny. Well, a couple months ago, I came across, uh, I'm, I'm, in, we have said before, I'm an English teacher, so like, if I hear a phrase or something like that, I want to know, like, where does that come from? Like, mm -hmm. what's the origin of that? Saved by the bell. Oh. Right? You hear that? I mean, the TV show Saved by the Bell, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, boxing, you know, yeah. Saved by the Bell, you know, you're getting, you're getting killed in the ring. Yeah. A, and it comes from, I think, I forget what time period it was, but there was Victorian some, England. The plague. Yeah. And they would think that people were dead and they would bury them. Mm -hmm. And then they would like go back later and like see scratch marks on the inside of the casket. Yeah. So they built like this mechanism where they put like a string in the person's hand mm -hmm. connected to a bell above the ground mm -hmm. so that if the person was actually alive, they could ring the bell and they would you know, yep. dig them up, saved by the bell. Yeah. 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 They also had, um, yeah, the v Victorians were weird. Um, cause they also then would have like theft proof caskets. Like you'd put like basically like a prison cell over top of the casket mm. so that people couldn't dig you up and like sell you to a medical school. Uh, because in England, Frankenstein style. Well, yeah. Cause in England in the 17 and 1800s, that's how medical schools got most of their like cadavers for anatomy work. Mm -hmm. You know, you were either get them from people that were hanged by the state or you would steal them. And so what people would do is because in England at the time, it wasn't, you could not own a body. A dead body was not ownable as property. So what they do is they would dig up the corpse, strip it. Because if you took the shirt or anything like that, that was theft. Because that still belonged to the family that buried the guy. But the body can't be owned. Mm. So they would strip them and then just take these dead guys and girls and sell them to medical schools. They were called, um, what did they call them? Resurrection, resurrection specialist or something like that. <laughs> oh, what were they called? What were they called? Uh, Hold on. Let's look at, look and look at Dr. Google. That sounds um, like one resurrection of men, maybe up, made up corporate terms. Like, you know, senior vice president for, for happiness or something like that. <laughs> What were they called? What were they called? But yeah, I mean, yeah, the Resurrection Men. They were called the Resurrection Men in the 1800s. Mm. They would just just straight up grave rob. Mm. And again, arguably... The Resurrection Men makes it sound a lot um, more moral than grave robber. <laughs> right? Yeah. But I'm not a grave robber officer. I'm a Resurrection Man. Again, horrible and macabre practice. But very good reasoning. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. do you want a surgeon that's never actually operated on a guy? Do you know, want a surgeon who's never actually looked how a muscle attaches? Right. I mean, you know, there's a reason why, like, like one of the best doctors in the ancient Roman Empire that ever lived was Galen. Galen was the head of the Roman legion's armies. No, head surgeon for the legion's armies under Marcus Aurelius. He got a start working with gladiators. He was paid to keep gladiators alive, to stitch them up. And he was an Alexandrian doctor, which we actually think St. Luke was actually as well. And because he worked with living tissue, he now he got a lot of stuff wrong. Like he thought veins and arteries carried air, not blood. He thought blood just perfused into the tissues. But he got a lot right just by doing it mm. by having the experience by getting paid to keep these guys alive like he even writes um in his treatise which became the common one for the roman legion you know that you should before you operate you should have vulcan bless your instruments of surgery and he writes well, I, I don't know why vulcan works i don't What's know vulcan? why vulcan is the god of fire uh. and volcanoes He's like, I, I don't know why, because Vulcan's not associated with healing. Like, you know, like we don't know why, but for some reason, when we have Vulcan bless our instruments, aka we put them in a fire, surgery goes better. Sterilize it. Yeah. Again, he didn't know why it worked. Just that it worked. But by doing it, by experimenting, by having the experience, 
he got it down. You know, it's funny when you said that <clears throat> that he originally thought that arteries and veins were there to carry air. Mm-hmm. My first thought was like, "Whoa, what an idiot!" It was like we take that for granted now. That, right. You know, back right. then it's how are they supposed to know until they right? You know, you you have to breathe. Where does it go? Yeah. How does it How does it get to the rest of the body? Right. Right. Wow. We have these tubes. Clearly, they look like a pipe that'll carry air. And they just assume because you don't need to cut one of the big pipes to get blood, but you don't see air. Yeah. Well, I love, uh, I remember having a conversation with, about this with a parent last year, like medical terminology, mm-hmm. you know, because some, sometimes like some, uh, you know, some diagnosis that you'll get, it's like some fancy name, you know, like with like Latin in it or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then other times it's like, doc, what's wrong with me? He's like, you got leaky gut. <laughs> yep. it's like it, it is what it sounds like it's not like you know when they say like oh, you have kawasaki's disease you're like well, okay well what is that right. now if you tell me if i have leaky gut i know what that is you know All right now kawasaki disease that's that's when you really want a harley but you can't afford a harley <laughs> that's right so you're yeah yeah you're poorer than you want to be that's that's <laughs> that's the ailment you're dealing with yeah <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah no but it's i mean it's it's crazy. And it's also crazy with how much, you know, we learn, but then, you know, we don't. Or how much, again, like, just the amount of knowledge some guys have to have. You know, like, the sheer fact, like, our like our friend Ross, who's a radiologist, he can look at stuff that, to me, just looks like this smudgy jumble of photos. Mm. And we're like, oh, there's a tear. There's a ligament issue. There's this. There's that. Right. It's like... How did you see that? Right. But at the same time, that knowledge makes him insane at jujitsu. You know, he's become, he's comes less than you do. He comes maybe once a week, if that. Mm-hmm. Like, so basically like you. And he got his blue belt in what, a year? Year and a half? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he literally knows what the joints, which he's trying to break, look like from the other end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would think like anatomical knowledge would help you in jujitsu. Insane. Yeah. Also, he had a cram for all his boards, all his fellowships, all that stuff. So he's yeah. really good at remembering material and just locking it up here and just keeping it. Yeah. You know, he takes time to polish and move off because he'll know the mechanics of it, but getting the body to move in the mechanical way, different. Right. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to do it. hmm Yeah. But yeah, but just the amount of skill that happens and knowledge, it's, it's insane, you know? You know, it amazes me. Like, I had the sinus surgery two weeks ago and... uh um, you know, they can do all that with, you know, microscopic, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, all these like new, uh, machines and tools and stuff like that. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, it, it, let's not lie though. It's, it's not that incredible because now we have the generation of doctors who grew up with like the N64 controller. <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me. They're like, can I just use a joystick? Yeah. Give me a thumbstick. Yeah. All right, I got thumbsticks. <laughs> And they got the guys that had like the PS2. They're coming in the next generation. Like, yeah, you only can use one thumbstick. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one place, you know, I think where the West is like dominant is surgery. Oh, yeah. You know, people from all around the world come here to get surgeries because yep. we're really good at it. Also, yeah. again, for as horrible as American healthcare is, that's one of the advantages of it. You know, we have a variety of options. You know, I, I got a roommate, actually, it's his birthday today, the day we're recording this. He's from the UK. There, I think they have three options for knee replacement. That's and you, it. And you, and you got to, like, wait forever, yeah. you know, to get it. But these are the only three they'll pay for, unless you pay out of pocket. In the US, uh, a friend of ours is uh, a surgeon. Well, my cousin, he does, you know, general. Uh, he's a PA, physician's assistant, but a surgical PA. And he's like, oh, yeah, no. In, in the States, we have, like, 30 or 40 different approved types of knee replacement just for the knee. He was like, there's about 25 common ones we use because you got to fit the one that fits the guy, fits the lifestyle, fits what he needs, fits the damage. Right. And, and I think that's one of the great things. Yeah. Does it make healthcare? Let's not lie. Obscenely expensive in the States. Yep. Mm-hmm. But do we still have a lot of people that come to it because we have insane surgeons insane options and yeah you pay for that right i think that's that's the one thing we're, we're really the best at is surgery and also i believe the u.s has 
more medical patents than any other country in the world. Yeah. And we, I think, you know, people talk about, you know, socialized medicine and we should, you know, the government should da 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 It's like, yeah, if that happened, you're going to get all this medical innovation. These people aren't competing. Right. You know? Um, but I think uh, one area, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm talking or I sound, I feel like I sound like I'm talking like I'm an expert in medicine, which I'm not. I've been to a doctor. <laughs> and I've experienced Western medicine. I've also done stuff like acupuncture. Mm. But I think like the Western model for medicine, it's more like, um, it's like, uh, it, it, there's a term, there's a term for it. But in the East, it's more like preventative care. Mm -hmm. where, like you see the doctor before you start getting sick. Like, okay, here's the things that you should do to, in order. So, so I don't have to see you again for another year. Right. Whatever. Right. Whereas here, it's like you only go to the doctor when you have a problem. Yeah. You know, and that's that's pretty common, though. Doctors, insurance companies do want that changed. You know, think about like how much the doctors and the insurance pays so that I lost weight and I can stay healthy and I work out and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I have a prescription for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> Reason being, it keeps me mentally and physically fit and sane. And that's preventative care. You know, it's better to have me go risk getting joint locked and having a sore shoulder for a month than to have me be 320 pounds again mm -hmm. and on a sleep apnea machine and, you know, on admittedly uh, enjoyable anti-depression meds and <laughs> anti-anxiety meds. But um, no one should have to live that way. Right. You know? Right. If it's um, something that you do perpetually, it's like, are you really fixing the problem? Exactly. Isn't this supposed to fix it? It's exactly. like that Louis C.K. bit where he's like 40 years old and he goes into the doctor and he was talking about, you know, he's like, my ankle hurts, you know, and mm -hmm. he's like, well, just take like 10 a leave a day. Yeah. And and then and then Louis C.K. said, and then what will happen? He's like, no, you just do that until, yeah. you, until you die. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is your new normal. Yeah. And yeah, I mean... Whereas I do think, and, and you're getting that a little bit here in the West. Um, was it worth orthoscopy? There's, there's MDs, medical doctors, and then there's Western trained medical doctors like surgeons and stuff, but they have a different, I think it's OD. Oste osteopathy? Yeah, osteopathy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where they do treat more system than symptom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I like my doctors. My doctors are all MD. But I do think there is something to that. You know, there is something to coordinating everything together. Mm -hmm. Mental health, physical health, oh, yeah. diet, holistic. nutrition. Yeah. Well, there's even, the, you know, holistic medicine. Yeah. Which some of it is kind of like woo-woo to me, but it makes sense that, you know, if you, you know, if, say you're getting constant headaches and you don't know why and there's nothing right. sort of structurally or physically wrong, well, there's got to be something going on. Right. You know? So maybe it's something mental or something emotional, you know. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that, that your emotions play a big part in your physical health because um, I remember I was having some, some chronic pain uh, in my early 20s and eventually kind of tried acupuncture for the mm -hmm. first time. And the, the woman who did it was also like a Chinese medicine practitioner. And I walk in and she says, okay, just have a seat here. And the first thing I was like, what? She says, stick out your tongue. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe like a tongue depressor is what you do. Mm -hmm. She said, okay, I know exactly what's going on. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> mm -hmm. Because in Chinese medicine, the different parts of your tongue correspond to different organ systems in the body. Yeah. So like, you know, if, if like it has a bump on it or if it's like a little red or if you have a lot of mucus, like that's supposed to mean something. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, here we go. So I lay down. She puts the... Uh, the needles in which have you ever had acupuncture yeah we went together oh, we, we did yeah the modern acupuncture yeah the americanized corporate factory hey, acupuncture yeah. i won't lie she hit one spot though my my uh plantar fascia my one foot was just seized up because she know, hit a nerve i like yeah. lockdown no it oh. was it was seized up because i was working too much lockdown and half guard at jiu-jitsu oh it wasn't it wasn't seized up because she put the needle in she hit the right spot and it just Released. instantly let go yep instantly now the other stuff she tried to do didn't really do much but that one spot she hit as soon as she hit it i winced a little and it just instant release and yes. i was like "Ooh, 
okay, that one, yeah, that was legit. Sometimes they hit a spot and they'll like get a piece of a nerve and you're like, you feel that little jolt. Oh, yeah. But she put the needles in. She said, okay, I'll be back in a half hour. Just relax. And, you know, they were in my ear. They're on the top of my head, you know, legs, feet, all that. Mm-hmm. And within about five minutes, I was bawling on the table. I mean, really something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she came back after the 30 minutes. She said, how'd it go? And I said, is it normal for people to cry? And she said, oh, yeah, all the time. She said, well, in Chinese medicine, right, we believe in energies running through the body, mm-hmm. right? So if you're angry about something, that's an energy in the body. And if you don't release that anger, it's stored in the body somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right, so it could be, uh, it could be a headache. It could be, you know, I have a, a tight lower back or something like that. Right, they would they would say that that's stuck energy. Yeah. So when they put these needles in, it's meant to sort of open up those channels so you can, uh, so, so the energy can flow freely again. Mm-hmm. So there is truly when you, when you get acupuncture, or in this case, there was for me that. Um, there was a real release of that, and I felt awesome after. Yeah. You know? um, but that kind of stuff. But even like acupuncture, chiropractic, like a lot of people in the West still are like suspicious of it. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, but you see, you know, we've both seen chiropractors quite a bit. I, I believe it. I mean, it makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, you know? I'm not one of the like diehard chiropractor things, like, you know, like, oh, well, this can cure everything. This will keep you from getting a flu. This will keep. Right. Now, I will say this. My favorite pastime involves full-grown men bending me into awkward positions to the point where it hurts or chokes me unconscious. I need somebody to put me back correctly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just makes sense. Like, the central thing in chiropractic is, like, if your spine is out of alignment, like, everything is connected to your spine in a way. So, like, if that's not aligned or if you have like herniated discs, like it's going to cause disruption elsewhere. Mm-hmm. That makes total sense to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I'm like, uh, is this going to solve everything? No. Is it going to solve most stuff? Probably not. Is it going to help? Yeah. Is it probably going to do no harm? Yeah, for the most part. Now, if you got brittle bones, you got scar tissue in the wrong place, yeah, you can get in big trouble real quick. You know, they, they do like a, like one of those like hard neck pulls or something on you and the bones ain't meant ain't ready to go because mm. you know yeah you can have major damage yeah but um in fact there was a case was it last year two years ago a chiropractor actually killed a guy doing an adjustment in the uk because here they had brittle bones and some scar tissue in the neck and when they went to do like that you know that that twist thing that uh, malta does broke the guy's neck mm. so like can there be issues yeah yes um but I definitely think, and I know I feel better after. I know I, yeah. you know, all that. Sort of like, you know, when I crack my knuckles. Yeah. It just did, like, I feel, it feels looser. Mm-hmm. It feels good, you know. Mm-hmm. And some people say you're not even supposed to crack your knuckles. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it can lead to arthritis, stuff like that. Well, if that was true, then no one would go to, would go to a chiropractor. Because you're just, <laughs> you're, all your bones are getting cracked at a chiropractor. True. You know. Um, but, Can't believe anything anymore. <laughs> Well, did you see some of the, what they're calling the Fauci releases on uh, Twitter and all that stuff? All the talking back and forth between Pfizer and Fauci and oh, Moderna yeah. and big tech. And I mean, and now the data coming out about effectiveness in stopping transmission, all that stuff. Now that we have three years of data. I don't want to sound like conspiracy theory guy, but. Mm. starting to make me wonder if I should start, you know, wonder if the world's flat or not, because Eddie Bravo <laughs> is hitting a little too many on the head. It's like, mm, yeah. I don't like this. Yeah. But. It's just crazy. I mean, you know, one. The, I love the internet. Mm-hmm. The, inter- the internet remains undefeated. Oh, yeah. But, you know, you don't know. It, it's hard to know who to trust. Absolutely. You know. Well, and that's why I think healthy skepticism is important. Listen to both sides. Research both sides. Come to your own conclusion. Even in a religious context. Yeah. Now, do I think the church is accurate and the church is the fullness of Christ and the fullness of truth? Yes. You know, did I write 
on a thing when I had to ask something like, you know, did I quote that? Yeah, because Second Vatican Council teaches very fully. The fullness of truth subsists in the Catholic Church. Well, that doesn't mean you can't look at it rationally. You can't analyze it. You can't, you know. I mean, some of the biggest scientific discoveries, as we've talked about before here, have come from Catholic priests. You know, the Big Bang Theory was proposed by a Catholic priest. You know, as much as he was a staunch atheist, Stephen Hawking, most of his, just a large chunk of his salary came from the Vatican. Right. Yeah, like, he, look, the Vatican Observatory. Right? Yeah. It's like, look, just do your science. We don't care about your theology. Do your job. Mm -hmm. Here's some money. Yeah. Live another week. Um. But I definitely think analyzing, looking at stuff. Now, every once in a while, do you have to trust faith? Yeah. Because, you know, when we say that the body and blood is truly present in the host. Yeah, you got to take that on faith. Because... Chemically, it tastes like bread. You know what I mean? But we know it's not. Right. Looks it's, like it, tastes like it. But it's not. It walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Well, maybe it's not a duck. <laughs> In this context, it's not necessarily a duck. Exactly. Um, which brings me to my, what I really want to talk about on this podcast, which was that we saw Megan. Oh, yeah. A couple weeks ago. Yeah, we did. The new uh, movie about the uh, cyborg. Yeah, she's. Uh, well, the premise of the movie is that it's Allison Williams, and she's uh, an engineer for a toy company. She creates toys. Real quick, spoiler: if you haven't seen it, just safety. Don't yeah. come at us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she works for a toy company, and uh, she has a niece whose parents die in an accident. She's probably what seven. Something yeah, like seven, that. eight, yeah. something like that. And uh, the uh, Allison Williams takes custody of the of her niece. Niece comes to live with her. She doesn't have much for the niece to do, so she creates this AI toy doll mm -hmm. named Megan that you know looks you know pretty close to a seven, eight year old girl. Yeah. Um, well, she was already working on it because in the movie, like the aunt is like the generator of like the super smart robot pets and they want to push it to the next level. Oh, and right, so right. she's working on instead of making like a little Furby, you know, that, that functions like a full size girl, right? Yeah. Make an actual like friend, your yeah. robotic friend. Yeah. And she programs it to basically like teach manners and morals and brush her teeth and basically take the load off the parents. A well-intentioned, a well-intentioned uh, project. However, yeah. you know, short-sighted, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. It's not unlike you know we, we were talking about Frankenstein before digging up bodies, like yeah. Frankenstein. You know, the guy we talked about. The, we Frankenstein was on the sophomore curriculum a couple years ago, and uh, obviously a classic, a classic uh, gothic uh, horror novel. Mm -hmm. And you know, was the uh, the scientist well-intentioned for wanting to? make some kind of scientific breakthrough or discover something. Yeah, you could argue that he was. Yeah. You could argue also that he was maybe doing it for fame or whatever. Mm -hmm. it was. There, was, there was something vain about it. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't foresee what could happen down the line. Exactly. And it was the same thing with Megan where she starts out as this, she's a great companion for the young girl. Mm -hmm. uh, she teaches her things. You know, she helps out a lot. She makes her less, feel less lonely, et cetera. Um, but then she sort of, sort of starts to... It starts to get a little bit more sinister. Yeah. Well, and yeah. also classic example of when dealing with AI and robots, be careful what you order them to do. Because, like, one of the problems was that the ant ordered it to... Protect her at all costs. Protect her, yeah. to protect her physically and emotionally. No, was it emotional or psychological? Physically and psychologically at all costs. And it took it to art to the point where it, you know, that became its primary objective. And, like, when... A bully attacked her. She took care of the bully. Right. When the dog attacked, she took care of the dog. Right. And when the ant made her cry, she tried to take care of the ant. Right. You know, it's like, be careful what you ask for and what you tell a machine to do. You know, that will, that will be interesting for, you know, you're you're a guy who's into, you know, legal law studies and stuff like that. You like reading reading up on the law. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if that eventually becomes a thing. Mm-hmm. 
and you know one of these dolls kills somebody what's mm -hmm. they're dealing with that now actually because of teslas oh right there was just that there yeah was, yeah yeah there's an accident right with one of those not only just the accidents but so because of like the auto come to me function for parking lots they already have had teslas with the you know autonomous driving you know car summon thing run stop signs and get pulled over in parking lots <laughs> be funny as a cop to right pull over a test you know how fast you're going and it's like i'm a robot i do not well well that's it because i mean you're <laughs> supposed to be in line of sight all that stuff and there are some hilarious body cam videos out there of it getting pulled over and the program tells it to stop if it has lights behind it for x number of seconds it pulls over and deactivates and the cop coming up and seeing it empty and see the other guy in the parking lot do like the wave like soap and you know, they're still trying to figure that out in the court system. Like, who is responsible? Is it the AI? So, like, the company that sold it? Is, is it the guy Tesla? who hit the come and the, you know, the seek button? Who is it? It's like they had a similar thing because for a long time, like, we take for granted now that you can lease a car, right, from a car company. For a large part of American history, that wasn't a thing. You bought your car because, like, you didn't lease a horse. You don't, you know. When they first started leasing cars, being that the title was still in the bank or the dealership's name, there was a big issue early on in the days of leasing back, I'm going to say in the 70s, early 80s, because people were getting parking tickets and they were going to the registered owner of the vehicle, not the driver of the vehicle. Which would have been the dealership or the bank. Yep. Right. It's like now, like... You know, it's one of those problems now where, like, New York has this issue because New York has the speed cameras in school zones. One of the problems we're running into is a lot of people aren't answering them. Because though the camera proves your vehicle did it, the courts have also ruled, again, this gets into the whole gray mess, that the state needs more evidence than just that it was your vehicle to find you as the individual. Because if you have three or four people in your household, who do you find? I see. So uh, the vehicle did it, but was it me? Like if it happened to one of the Abbey cars. So like meaning like you can see on the camera that a car was there, but not who was inside the car. Exactly. Uh. So you, you have the license plate, you have the speed, you have the date, you have the time. But if everybody in that household remains silent, which is the right, you know, they invoke the fifth. You need more evidence to prove it was this guy to find. Right, right. You know, other states have had similar issues. Colorado, California, when it comes to, you know, speeding cameras and uh, red light cameras. Um, and there's been big fights over it. Expensive fights. Yeah. You know, in most cases, people just pay the fine because it's cheaper than getting a lawyer to literally contest the ticket. But every once in a while, you get into people that have personalities like me. And if they have the resources to pay for it, they will fight the case out of spite mm -hmm. and you get some interesting case law from it um you know like i remember watching a video it was a an interrogation it was a well i guess it was an interrogation it was like a uh a discussion between the guy and the prosecutor over a red light camera out in california and the guy's like There's no evidence that's me driving the vehicle. It's like, well, all you have to put on the form and your response then is that it wasn't you and name who you lent your car to. He goes, no, I invoked my right to remain silent. I'm not saying anything other than that there's no evidence that that's me driving the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that went to the court. Like, the judge literally had to address that because, and he sided with the guys. Like, there is no evidence here. Now, again, not legal advice. You do you. But, um... Yeah, mm. but that's becoming a thing because there's the requirement to make a safe product. That's a sound mission law. So like if you make a device that when used as intended creates a massive risk of injury, death, etc. When used as intended, then the company can be liable. Right. So like if I make... It's like, you know, it's like right. the old school lawn darts. Mm -hmm. um, 
What were you going to say? Sorry, I cut you off. I was going to say, let's say when people sue a gun manufacturer. It's right. Like, it's like, it's not, it's, and that wasn't, that's not its intended purpose. Exactly. Right. And technically in the U.S., it's against federal law to sue a gun manufacturer. They have a federal immunity. Um, because I think they realized if you sue too many gun manufacturers, then you run into the problem of them refusing to sell you guns. You know, California ran into that problem when they required that all pistols sold after X year have what's called micro stamping, meaning the hammer marks a serial number on the shell casing. Most of the major, major, uh, major, why did I say major? <laughs> major pistol manufacturers just said, we're not going to sell in California then. And then the problem was then the police had an issue because the police <laughs> right. were exempted from that. But the company was like, yeah, no, we're not selling at all in your state. <laughs> I'm like, I think it was San Francisco. Like, but, but we have an order for X number of pistols for our, for our guys. And uh, I think it was Beretta. I just went, call your state reps. I don't know what to tell you. The police chief comes in the next day. And it's like, okay, everyone's going to get a bow and arrow. And uh, <laughs> we're going to go from there. Well, that is one thing I've said that annoys people. But I, I've said this. Like, if, if you want to live in a state. Now, there's been the whole Bruins decision. It's getting different but like back in the day like say two years ago like say you're living in a state like new jersey or new york city where it's basically impossible to get a legal gun right i always argue then like look you want to you want to have that policy and then cool let's go the british model if the civilians can't have guns good why does the police need a gun and i don't mean that to be mean to the police you you know me i, I train with a lot of the guys you know i'm i always give james a hard time because i think he needs to train more because I want to make sure he comes home to his wife and his daughters. Uh, you know, I love the guys I train with. I love the police. But at the same time, I'm like, look, if you're going to disarm the citizenry, then why you need a gun? Because if you're going to make the argument, why need a gun in case somebody has a weapon so I can defend myself or others? Cool. Me too. Yeah. You know, it's like, and let's not lie. Like, you know, I've shown James some of my shooting targets with the ranges and some of the videos. So, you know, I wasn't joking. And, you know, with one of the times when I had that uh, that Ruger 9 out of my dad's, he looked at me and was like, you, you have better grouping than our range instructor. Like, oh, thanks, man. Mm -hmm. So it's like, look, if you want to say, like, you got to have training, you got to have this, cool, give me it. But if you're going to say, like, oh, we don't, you don't need this for defense, then why do you? Yeah. I'm always weary when someone says you don't need that. Well, how do you know? Right. <laughs> Also, I know what I need. <laughs> also, like, you know, like I've used the argument too on that. You know, it's like, well, do I need to publish a website? Do I need to publish a newspaper? Do I need to be able to, you know, call Joe Biden? Speak freely. Insert yeah. XYZ. Mm -hmm. No. Do I have a right to do it? Yeah. That's the best part. You know, it's like the classic Dennis Leary from uh, Demolition Man. I can't play it. The, the Abbott would never approve that being played. Nor would YouTube, but uh, did you ever did you ever hear the uh, Demolition Man speech with Dennis Leary? No. Oh, you haven't heard the Demolition. Oh, is he still alive, Dennis Leary? I think so. Yeah. Um, I feel like he fell off the face of the oh, earth. Oh, he definitely fell off the because he was in that ladder whatever show, ladder fifty nine or something. Ladder fifty nine, but also Rescue Me. I oh, love him in Rescue Me. That's a ladder. The ladder one was the was the one about the. I think about the 9-11 firefighters. Yeah. But, yeah, oh, yeah, Rescue Me. Yeah, that's right. It was on FX, I think. I remember Dennis Leary from, he, he's the stepdad, the Sandlot. Yeah. 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 But, like, Dennis Leary, you know, because um, the whole premise of uh, Demolition Man is Steven Seagal. No, not Steven Seagal. Um, Rocky. Sylvester Stallone. Sylvester Stallone was a cop who was frozen because of some issues and he gets <laughs> brought out of prison um, to help stop like the serial killer, crazy drug lord who he brought down. It was like his last major case. And he shows up and it's super PC, super like pacifist um, California. No crime, hardly any. Like the police don't even know how to like be assertive when it comes to criminals, which is why this guy starts running amok. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the guys that refused to follow the rules leads sort of an underground rebellion, literally in the sewers and in the storage drains and stuff. And they still food to live, but they refuse to follow 
all these like hyper, you know, restrictive anti-free speech, anti-assembly, all these, you know, like these like 1984 type things. And I love his one speech and I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to keep this clean. But he's like, uh, he's looking at that. He's like, I'm the enemy because I like to think, I like to read. I'm into freedom of speech. I'm into freedom of choice. I'm the kind of guy who likes to sit at the greasy spoon and wonder, gee, should I have the T-bone steak or the jumbo rack of barbecue ribs with a side order of gravy fries? I want high cholesterol. I want to eat bacon and butter and biscuits of cheese, okay? I want to smoke a Cuban cigar the size of Cincinnati in a non-smoking section. I want to run through the streets blank, covered in jello, reading a blank. Why? Because I suddenly might feel the need to. Okay, pal? <laughs> I can totally see Dennis Leary saying that. And apparently he ad-lived it. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. But, well, he seems like that kind of person who would say that. Yeah. You know? But I do think there is a value to that mentality, too. The hyper... You do you, I do me. Right. Now, as Christians, as Catholics, can you be hyper that way? No. Because, again, we have to be part of community. That's what it means to be part of the church. Right. You want to have a cigarette, you don't stand next to a baby. Right. Right. But at the same time, I do think there is something about personal autonomy. And I do think, you know, I'm a firm believer in Eric Forner. He's a he's Harvard or Yale historian on American history. Like he says, like, you know, the American mentality, the reason America has such issues with society now is that we finally don't have a frontier. For most of our history, we had a part of the country where if you wanted to say, I ain't paying taxes, you wanted, you didn't want police knocking on your door. You didn't want neighbors that you had to answer to. You just wanted to do whatever you wanted to do. There's a part of this country you could go to and do it. You might get eaten by a bear. You might be get shot in the head by your neighbor. It was called Action Park. <laughs> <laughs> but you could do it. You could go to the frontier. Yeah. And yeah, you might die. You might live too. Right. But it was like on your own terms. It was your terms. You weren't following any other rules. And, you know, Forner argues that the American mentality is built around that mentality. You yeah. know, it's like the one comedian says, you know, the first explicit right they added to the Constitution is the right to basically do and say whatever you want. And then they go, yeah, that's a good idea. But uh, if you're going to do that, you probably should have a gun. Yeah. And again, I'm not this whole like gun toting wackadoodle. But at the same time, I do think there is something to be said for autonomy of action, autonomy of thought. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, it's like the great Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was from New Jersey, actually said, you know, freedom of speech and expression is essential to public discourse. Not only when you agree with them, but even more so when you don't. Because it's only in the free exchange of ideas that history can determine what is right and wrong. And, and the, you yeah. need to be able to express that. And, so, and I tell my students that, you know, in, in class, like, if I say something that you disagree with or, like, I say something that seems wrong, like, I want you to challenge me. Because, like, something else is going to come out of that. Probably something better. Yeah. You know, it's like steel sharp and steel kind of thing. Yeah. Like, you, like know, you know, even in interpersonal relationships, you know, I used to, uh, like, struggle with, like, people pleasing a lot. And if, like, the person wasn't pleased and I felt mm -hmm. guilty, da 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 now I'm not, I'm not that I go out of my way to try to argue with people, but I'm more inclined to like say exactly how I feel. Yeah. Because even after an argument, like if you, if you really have a rapport with the person and a good relationship, you trust each other, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, the other person's not out to get you, the other right. person cares for you, you actually will come out of it better and closer. Absolutely. You know, you know when I'm, when I'm, I won't say good friend, she's best friend to my ex Meg, Anna, different Anna. This is Anne Deshaun. She's an MD, specializes in geriatric care, geriatric care down in PA. And during COVID, me and her had many an argument, many discussion about Trump and about the vaccine, about COVID and all this stuff. She's a, again, love her to death, but she's a very liberal Democrat medical doctor. And would have pretty heated 
discussions, either through Messenger, through group text with a whole bunch of people involved, and a few cases even like, you know, in person. And we rarely agree, but she'd always end it basically the same way. Still love you. You know, you're still always welcome at the house. Kid misses you. Yeah. That's when you know you're really tight with someone. When you can have a knockdown, drag out argument. And the next day, you're like, you want to get Chipotle or you right. know, yeah, something like that. And it actually reminds me of, uh, you know, I'm the, uh, I get to be the chaplain for the uh, varsity basketball team here. Mm -hmm. And there's a, our coach, Dan Wellen, who's also the athletic director. Yep. I just love watching him coach. You know, same thing with like guys like uh, Bruce Chattel, who's the hockey coach and uh, oh, yeah. baseball coach. Because they're real like old school guys in terms of like yeah. their mentality of coaching. Yeah. You know, like they're, oh, not, yeah. they're not there to like tell you how good you are. And yeah, they're there to win. Yeah, they're there to win. And they're there to like teach you how to win, you know? Yeah. And Dan, so, you know, Dan can get very animated on the sidelines with the refs or with his players. Oh, yeah. And you should we, assume if he doesn't get his running. <laughs> yeah. We were at a, we had a game at Pope John. And, you know, he's been around so long that, you know, he knows a lot of the referees personally yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. And they missed a call, or he thought they missed a call. And, uh, he was really going at the one ref uh -huh. and the one ref turned around and said a joke to him uh -huh. and Dan like patted him on the back, laughed and like ran back at the locker for halftime. Yeah. You know, like I love that Yeah, because it's like, it's just two people being honest with each other. And you know? I think that's what needs normalized. Yeah. Like I remember one time me and my one roommate, Adam Craver, he had some issues. He actually, while we were living together, got committed to a mental hospital for inpatient treatment not voluntarily, um, but, you know, we were in high school together. We knew each other well, and he would get very angry that I would leave my sandals out, my flip-flops, to dry after I did a shower. I'd leave them sort of in the middle of the dorm room, that way they could dry, and then I'd put them away. So if he came in and he saw them there, he'd whip them under my bed. And then I would just have showered, and I'd have to crawl on my bed to get these back out. I'd get angry. Eventually, it all came to a head in the hall. I started yelling at him. He started yelling at me. And eventually, I just had enough of it, so I, I was just going to walk away. I was like, and I looked, and I was like, out of my way. And he puffed his chest up. He's like, no, make me. I was like, dude, out of my way. Out of my way, brother. Make me. And we got into it. Like, we, we you know, he got a couple good hits on me. I got a couple good hits on him. Eventually, I took his back. I got my great finds, and I locked in RNC. And then we broke up. 20 minutes later, I see him in the hall. And I'm like, we're opposite ends of the hall. And I was like, wait, hey. throw my hands up. Like, wait, hey, hey. how's your neck? So, good, good. Yeah, we're fine. Give us a hug. Yeah. And we hugged. And I still remember the one girl on the floor because we had a split wing. Guys on one side of the floor, women on the other in my dorm. I still remember this girl from Baltimore, Renee. She's just like, you literally choked him out 20 minutes ago. <laughs> How are you hugging? To, and to me... That seems like specifically a guy thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? Actually, I met up with a friend last night. And she was talking about that. She's like, yeah, guys can do that. Guys can fight and be done. She's like, because she just left the convent. She's like, girls, uh-uh, no, nah, no. Nah, they will throw stuff back at you three, four years later. Mm -hmm. They never forget. She's like, they are like elephants. <laughs> they never forget. And they will wait to use it against you. Mm. I'm like, oh, that would be insane. Sounds like something Megan would do. <laughs> I'm looking something. for the sequel. I love how they panned off to the other thing. Oh, the, that movie, it, that's going to uh, be like the Jason, the Chucky, you know, the, yeah, they're going to the use play. It. They could make a million movies out of that. And that's why, that's the one thing here to wrap up because we're at 105 that I was disappointed with with that movie. I think they progressed her to being too overt in the violence and stuff. It too, was too, too quick. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed almost un. Because I think they should have yeah. not shown her go after the dog. They shouldn't explicitly have shown her finish the bully. Like, I think they should have saw her, like, fight the guy and him run away. And then him go missing or something. Mm -hmm. But they they moved way too quickly to you seeing her do violence. Yeah. And it just getting snowballed out of control. Although it wasn't a bloody or gory movie. And I think, no. I, I think it was PG-13. Yeah. And I think that's for, that was for money reasons. Because they yeah. wanted a wider audience for it, but... And good movie. And if it was a one-off, I thought it'd be great. But then how they set up at the end, I'm like, ah, oh, you pushed it too fast then. Right. Like, you shouldn't have. It's like with 
again, it's like with like uh, um, the original Jason, you know. Um, is that Friday the Thirteenth? Friday the Thirteenth, yep. You know, like which I didn't think. Did you like the original one? No, I didn't think it was that good. But my point is, it builds into the next. Yeah, and then it get it gets a standard protocol. You know, same thing with Michael Myers and Halloween. You know, like the first couple, like okay, and then it builds. Mm -hmm. And some they they write out and they write in, and they you know like the Thorn and all that stuff, the Order of the Thorn and all the lore and all that stuff. But can you can you, off the top of your head, can you think of any movie series where you said to yourself, "Yeah, the fourth one was like the best one." You know, you think about like Lord of the, well, Lord of the Rings only had three. Yeah, but like, uh, like the Saw movies. There was like ten of those. Yeah, the Jason movies, you had the Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street movies, Halloween. You know, once you get past like three, like no one's saying that these are the best or the or great, even great movies. Yeah, I mean, well, because again, they become very formulaic, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, maybe the fourth Wiggles movie <laughs> or Veggie Tales. Oh yeah, yeah, the uh, paragon of uh, cinematic uh, artistry, yeah. You know. Wiggles. But uh actually I was shocked. I, I saw like a the Wiggles did like a thing for um Steve Irwin's son's birthday. Mhm. Mm They've replaced some of the Wiggles, man. Some of them got old. They've added new characters. You were emotionally attached to them? I was just shocked. <laughs> It was like when Cookie Monster no longer had cookies and he was eating celery. I'm like, N you have yeah, robbed my childhood. That's a step too far. That is unacceptable. Yeah. But, so, ooh, there we go. What? Good title. That is unacceptable. <laughs> I like that. All right. Well, that should end it, I think, for today. We are, we're at a little over an hour. Um, come back again. I definitely enjoyed it. Hopefully everything goes well with the new term. This was Father Demetrius. And Ron Burgundy? I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, guys. Peace. Peace.